Um, well, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm amazed by um, the turnout. Um, it's fantastic. And I'm also pretty amazed by the press coverage. Um, but I suppose uh, we should have been expecting um, a bit of a furore uh, with this new um, attribution. Um, I hope that you can hear me at the back. Can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Otherwise, I'll start shouting even louder. Um, what I really want to do today is just explain to you uh, the case. Uh, as art historians, um, it's our job to try to, uh, you know, uh, when, we, when we are uh, presented with fantastic works of art such as these bronzes, they are undocumented and they are unsigned and they're clearly by a great master. That, you know, we, it's, it's like sleuthing, it's like a Renaissance whodunit. Uh, we have to try our best to find out who made them and then to situate them within their uh, oeuvre. Uh, and I think what we have tried to do very clearly with this particular display and the accompanying booklet that I hope you'll all go and buy in the shop, only eight ninety nine, a very reasonable price, um, is to make it very, very transparent what that process of attribution is all about and why does it matter, and actually to make it very clear that um, opinions are um, subjective uh, and there may well be people out there in, in the audience today, uh, there certainly are um, in the world, we know, um, who do not agree with us. Um, some do, some are undecided, and we want you to make up your own mind. So what I'm going to do today is to present you the, the case that we are making as to why we believe firmly that these two bronzes are indeed by Michelangelo, modelled by him uh, and cast around 1506 to 1508. Uh, but I say, uh, please buy the book, please uh, watch the wonderful IT presentation on the tablet. Uh, there are various bits of news clips that also make, uh, I think, the, the, the case quite clearly. Um, but please do look at them and please make your own mind up and we'd love to hear if there's a visitor feedback uh, slip that you can fill in um, with your um, responses to the case. Um, just in case I forget at the end, uh, there is going to be an international symposium here in Cambridge, Downing College on Monday the 6th of July, when further findings by um, a team of international experts uh, will be presented uh, and by that point we hope uh, that uh, there will be a general consensus of opinion, um, hopefully um, in, uh, uh, in acceptance of our case, but maybe not, so we'll see. So it's kind of watch this space for the next six months and uh, see what happens. Anyway, I'm starting off with this rather uh, nice, intriguing quotation from Martin Gayford, who's been a great supporter of this project from the start. Uh, again, his wonderful biography of Michelangelo is also on sale um, in the shop. But he says, it's always been known that Michelangelo Buonarroti made sculptures from bronze as well as marble. However, they disappeared centuries ago, or at least it has long been delivered, uh, sorry, been, uh, been believed. So the case that we're making is, is almost like a, a nice solid uh, stool with, with three legs. So um, I, as an art historian, are ver um, am very much uh, involved in the, um, the visual evidence, and that's what I'll be explaining uh, at the start of this talk. But there's also um, a lot of technical evidence from colleagues in the Rijksmuseum, conservation scientists who've um, undertaken technical analysis of the bronzes, and there's also some very interesting anatomical evidence. So if you don't believe the woolly, potentially more subjective visual evidence, we hope that you'll be convinced by the more objective uh, scientific evidence. I wanted just first of all to start off by actually showing you um, some slides of the, uh, of the bronzes, just to show you their quality. Um, these bronzes have been known since uh, the late 1870s. Uh, they were, as to, to our knowledge, they were first publicly shown in a great exhibition in Paris, the Exposition Universelle in Paris Trocadero in 1878, where the attribution at that point was indeed to Michelangelo. After that, immediately afterwards, uh, that attribution was dismissed by a French art critic called Ejun Pio. Uh, for no, he gave no substantive reasons for dismissing that attribution. He said, but no, they're not by Michelangelo, they're by a Venetian sculptor called Tiziano Espetti. Now, what we suspect, we don't know, is that it may have been out of sheer jealousy and spite. Uh, Pio was also an art collector. He had some fantastically important works of art in the Trocadero exhibition. Uh, but actually, uh, 
we feel that he felt upstaged. We know from uh, catalogues of the exhibition that the Rothschild bronzes, so-called because they were owned by uh, Baron Adolf de Rothschild, uh, they were centre stage in salle set in the exhibition, and obviously uh, Pio's bronzes and other works of art were kind of on the side. We feel he probably felt slighted, uh, probably didn't like Rothschild very much, so they just said, actually, you know, he wanted to diss his rival, and they're not by Michelangelo. Uh, and they've always been attributed to great Renaissance sculptors. So Tiziano Aspetti, very interesting. Uh, then that attribution was dismissed, brought back down to Florence Circle of Cellini, that was dismissed. Um, many other sculptors have been brought into connection, all very, very good, because the quality of the bronzes is exceptional. So whoever made them has to be a phenomenally good sculptor. And I'm just running through a few slides for you to see, and obviously, hopefully, after the talk, you'll actually be able to look at them in depth uh, for yourselves. But I think you can see the power, the dynamism. You look at these things, and actually, you can't take your eyes off them. They're very, very compelling. Look at the ferocity of the older Bacchant's face. Uh, it has this flashing eyes. The uh, open mouth is almost sort of communicating with us. Uh, this ferocity um, has, uh, is known in Italian as terribilità. It's literally the terribleness, the ferocity, the ferociousness. This is a typical aspect of Michelangelo's work, this power. Then you look at the body. It's actually a pretty complicated power. Pose, the arm is raised up, the twist of the torso, all very, very convincingly done. I'm showing you this detail of the uh, raised arm of the older backhand. You can see that it's been cast in with a solid cylinder. Uh, we're not uh, quite sure uh, what this cylinder is supposed to represent. Um, probably, I mean, these bronzes are actually not quite finished, so we believe that the original intention, had they been finished, is that that solid cylinder of metal would have been drilled through to take an attribute that explains what these curious, nude, athletic, muscled men um, are doing riding on the back of panthers. Um, we believe at the moment they, that the most likely reading of them is that they are Bacchants, that is, um, male followers of the wine god Bacchus. Uh, and if that's the case, the most likely uh, attributes they would have held is either perhaps uh, it would have been for the stem of a wine goblet, a cantharus, or perhaps um, a uh, thyrsus. Uh, this is um, a curious um, attribute of all Bacchants and followers of the wine god Bacchus, uh, namely um, a long a uh, stem of a great artichoke, uh, capped by um, a pine cone and then wound around by kind of ivy leaves or, or vine tendrils, something like that. So perhaps this is what they were intended to hold. We can see here from the slide and from the bronzes that this cast in cylinder probably meant they were supposed to hold some sort of attribute um, which was never actually put in um, place. But again, you can see the muscled arm, um, very, very compellingly done. Look at that back, typical Michelangelo's back, and I'll show you some slides later where we compare directly known autograph works by Michelangelo. And again, that hand, very, very beautifully angled, held close into the body, um, angled in, and that twist of the wrist, and then that typical, very unusual gesture of the hand, again, hallmarks, if you like, of Michelangelo. Again, you can see now the relationship of the rider to the panther. Interesting in that the men are very idealised, very, very beautifully rendered. The panthers um, are more stylized. Uh, they are full of character. They're very, very ferocious. Uh, but actually, they are characterised to the point almost of caricature. So I think for the 21st century audience, there is this sort of slight stylistic disconnect between the riders and their steeds. But I think that is actually uh, not, not unusual for Michelangelo. Um, and again, you can look at this wonderful thigh gripping um, the panther. The younger Bacchant, the clean-shaven, uh, slightly younger companion, um, came out of the, uh, uh, the mould slightly less well, and this is a bit of technical evidence I'll come back to later, but you can again see very compelling. Look at that twist of the upper torso, and again the hand held to the side, um, and again this complicated twist. To you know, whoever made these, say we firmly believe them to be Michelangelo, but whoever made them had a complete grasp of the human anatomy, the male body in action, and was competent enough and courageous enough to do this pretty complicated pose. As you can see here, 
but you can't see uh, in the display, they actually slot off their riders, uh, or, 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 off, off, their, off their panther. So they're actually cast in with this great lug of metal, um, a rectangular uh, solid piece of metal uh, that actually uh, continues up into their bodies. So what's interesting for us is that they were clearly designed always from the start to be accompanied. It's not like someone says, oh, well, you know, maybe they were later, maybe they were designed for something else, and then uh, they were associated at a later date with the panthers. Well, from a technical point of view, this is impossible. Um, that great rectangular lug of metal um, acts as a very nice way of slotting them securely and easily into the back of their panthers. And you can see uh, at the top of the panthers, there's the hole, and they just slot in. So they, it's easy to pop them on, and it's easy to pop them off. But I mean, they are heavy, so you'd be a bit careful you don't wrench your, your back. Anyway, so this is just a, uh, an initial description to say how fantastic uh, these bronzes are. You know, whoever modelled them was um, supremely competent and confident uh, and clearly loved the male body um, and uh, was in, you know, interested in doing this kind of binary opposition. They are in almost mirror image uh, poses, not quite this kind of duality, younger, older, uh, you know, we think of the Sistine Chapel, that sort of binary, typical Michelangelo. Anyway, what is the art historical evidence? What is the visual evidence? Well, this is me talking to Professor Paul Joannides. He is really the great big brains behind this whole um, uh, story. Um, he uh, uh, taught uh, history of art in um, the, the um, Department of Art History for 40 years. Um, and uh, uh, he is a great expert in all the masters of the Italian Renaissance, uh, Leonardo, Raphael, Titian, um, and Michelangelo, and he's particularly expert on, on drawings. Now, <clears throat> what I should say a little bit about the, the, the history of the bronzes, so um, they were in the Rothschild collection, I say uh, they um, were exhibited in 1878 in Paris. Uh, they were known to art history uh, experts, art historians, I think primarily through photographs, and this is how these attributions were made always slightly dodgy to make sight unseen attributions because particularly with three-dimensional sculptures and particularly with bronzes it's always better to be able to see them um, in the flesh or in the bronze and be able to walk around them and look at them and understand the scale of them anyway um, they reappeared in 2002 on the art market where they were purchased by the current owner who has generously allowed them to be here in the Fitzwilliam Museum for the last six months for Professor Joannides and I and other uh, art historians and scientists to study and then they're going, the loan is going to continue for another six months until early August so uh, the general public can enjoy them too. Anyway, <clears throat> 2002 he purchased them and at that point they were brought back into uh, art historical consciousness uh, and in 2003, they were exhibited in New York in the Frick Collection. There was an exhibition dedicated to an important Dutch Renaissance sculptor uh, called Wilhelm van Tetrode, who in fact, uh, although he was Dutch, born in Delft, he came to Florence and he studied in the workshops of people like Cellini. So um, the attribution to, uh, to Tetrode was actually quite interesting uh, and, and, and far from stupid. Um, so it was, they were shown in New York as part of that Tetrode treasure show with a question mark could they be by him that attribution um, fell away uh, and then some of you may remember these bronzes from their exhibition in the wonderful survey show called bronze um, at the royal academy 2011 2012 uh, curated by uh, professor david exurgeon uh, who's head of art history at leicester university um, it was interesting for me and many art historians to have the chance to look at them um, in the context of this bronze show um, there are nearly 200 items selected from um, all continents and all geographies. It was a great big celebration of the art of bronze sculpture. African bronzes, Asian bronzes, European bronzes from thousands of years before Christ right up to the present day. So it was interesting that these were selected um, <clears throat> and they were described in the catalogue as Rome, made in Rome about 1550 and sort of associated very loosely with Michelangelo. So that's the kind of current state of play. Um, and that opportunity in London um, gave art historians a chance to rethink them, thinking, well, actually, uh, you know, who are they by? They've got to be by somebody very good. Um, and it was Paul 
who made the connection with this very important drawing, little known, uh, in the Musée Fabre in Montpellier in France. Uh, and you'll see, hopefully down the bottom there, um, a little tiny detail. And I'm going to sort of whack it there so those of you at the back um, can see it a little bit better. I'm just going to flick back just for a second. This is an interesting sheet. It's not by Michelangelo, it's important to understand that, but these are believed to be facsimile, copy, so on a one-to-one -one scale, by a pupil of Michelangelo, done about 1508, and these are copies of lost drawings by Michelangelo. So what we believe these to be, all these little individual sketches, the Virgin and Child, you've got other nude figures, uh, and then you've got uh, the little detail at bottom right. They are, we believe, absolutely accurate copies of lost works by Michelangelo. And seemingly this insignificant detail, bottom right-hand corner, is, you can see, a nude youth uh, riding a panther. It's pretty similar in pose and form to the Rothschild bronzes. So it was Professor Joannidis who made this vital link. Now, obviously, this little tiny detail would not be sufficient in and of itself to make the attribution to Michelangelo, but what it does do is that it provides us with a legitimacy to go back and reconsider that original 1878 attribution, which was so rapidly dismissed without good reason. What this little drawing proves, as I say, is that the, the copyist, we believe a, a pupil of Michelangelo, it was made about 1508, so it proves that Michelangelo and his circle were interested in this very, very unusual theme of a new chap on the back of a panther at this early date. The other thing which is important to understand is that the technique uh, this is pen, uh, uh, um, 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 a brown ink on paper, is quite a hard graphic outline, and we believe that the technique used by the copyist mirrors the original lost drawing by Michelangelo, so Michelangelo would likewise have been doing this in pen and ink. Professor Joannidis' his argument is that actually this quite um, graphic technique, hard lines, um, quite a mim minimalist technique, is the technique that Michelangelo more frequently used when he was thinking about compositions for three-dimensional sculpture than for pictorial works. So if you make that connection, this little copy, after a lost work by Michelangelo, seems to indicate that Michelangelo was thinking about this precise theme uh, in the first part of the um, 16th century. So this allows us to go back to that 1878 attribute and think, let's revisit it. We're going to have to do due diligence here because if we are stupid enough to raise our heads above the parapet and say, we think these are by Michelangelo, we will be shot down as complete fools. Nobody wants that to happen to them. So um, we went all the way through Michelangelo's known oeuvre, looking at his paintings, his uh, his, 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 um, his sculpture and a lot of drawings. It's important to remember Michelangelo, genius that he was, uh, didn't complete all of the works that he started and also, unfortunately, not all of his works survive. So the drawing component of Michelangelo's oeuvre is vital because it shows us certain projects that he was working on at particular points in his career which no longer survive, but they are vital to, for our understanding, our complete understanding of Michelangelo and what he was doing um, when. Now, in addition to uh, the Musée Fab drawing, there are a number of sheets, again, some autograph originals by Michelangelo and some copies by his students, where actually uh, he's interested in um, savage felines, lions, panthers, whatever. This is a sheet uh, in the Albertina in Vienna, and you can see um, these lions and panthers which actually, I hope you can see, we've just extracted certain details from them, that actually this type of feline, this type of panther, is very similar to, stylistically very similar to the Rothschild panthers. Okay. Now, um, Paul, who knows uh, Michelangelo's drawings almost better than anybody living, um, you know, is, is very convinced by this argument that there are very few other Renaissance artists during the first decade of the 16th century who actually 
are interested in wild, large cats. Few of them do pussy cats, domestic cats, but there's no evidence of anybody doing wild cats, panthers, whatever. So the fact that actually there are these drawings by Michelangelo and his, uh, his, his, his immediate circle shows that, again, he was interested in, uh, in wild cats. Now, thinking about sculpture, thinking about the date, so we went through all of Michelangelo's work that is documented, um, and Paul and I and other experts felt that the most compelling stylistic comparisons were to be made with the work of the first decade of the 16th century. So, uh, and actually within that, you can hone down right to really probably about 1506 to 1508. It's a very, very interesting period in Michelangelo's career. He's in his early 30s, so he's born in uh, 1475, and he dies in 1564. He has a huge, long career. He's active for over 75 years, um, so there's an awful lot of work to go through. Um, and, uh, you know, his preferred subject matter is the idealised, isolated male nude so um, but within all of that uh, great output that that genius output um, the works that he produced within the first decade of the 16th century so 1500 to 1510 and then zoning down 1506 15 we all feel makes the most sense is closest now everybody knows this uh, chap here in the middle, um, the marble David carved by Michelangelo between 1501 and 1504. And I put this slide up because it's very important to realise that actually in that first decade of the 16th century, yes, Michelangelo is doing a lot of important marble carving, and this is the uh, material that, with which we associate most closely Michelangelo as a sculptor. But we know, it's documented firmly, that he was actually involved in two very significant commissions in bronze, but sadly, neither survive. Okay, so I'm going to show you this rather irritating little drawing, and those at the back, you'll have to stand up and look. The first commission that we know Michelangelo was involved in, invol uh, a bronze commission in the 16th century, was again for a figure of the biblical hero David. So, say, 1501 to 1504, he's busy carving the marble, David. Well, in 1502, the Florentine Republican government ask him to make an almost life-size statue of the nude figure of David in bronze for an important French grandee for his chateau. This is the Chateau de Bury uh, in, in, in France. Uh, and Michelangelo worked hard on this. It's about two-thirds life-size, so not half as large as the marble, but nonetheless a very significant commission. He works on it 1502 to 1504. Um, he makes the wax casting model, it's cast, he starts to finish it, and then Pope Julius II calls him to work in Rome, and so an associate of his called Benedetto da Rovizzano finishes this bronze David, and it gets sent off to France in about 1507, and is popped in the, one of the courtyards of this fa fantastic French chateau, um, and it's there for everybody to look at and admire. Unfortunately, um, there are no good visual records of it, apart from this um, very, very loose drawing uh, by uh, de Cerceau, who's more interested in the French architecture of the chateau. Uh, it is in the great big book about the beauties of French chateaus and architecture. But at least you see the little uh, statue standing on a column in pride of place. Anyway, the statue survives until the later 18th century, uh, and we're not quite sure what happens to it. There is a possibility that it may still actually exist uh, in, in, in the attic of a French chateau. Wouldn't that be marvellous if it were to reappear? I fear that the likelihood actually is that it got melted down in the French Revolution, probably converted into a cannon and was lost. But you must remember, say, 1502, 1508, Michelangelo is documented as having made this French uh, um, a bronze David for France. A couple of years later, 1507, Michelangelo is commissioned by Pope Julius II to make an absolutely colossal seated portrait statue of himself for the facade of the principal church in Bologna, uh, San Petronio. Now, um, this is a very politically uh, controversial commission. Um, the 
the Pope is the, the overlord of Bologna. He doesn't actually own Bologna, but he's taken it's part of the papal state. The Bolognese absolutely hate him. Um, he's just crushed a civil revolt, and this is why he wants it's actually well, he's a seated figure, so the, the actual bronze we understand from measurements and documents was over twice life size. Had the Pope actually stood up, he would have been three times life size. This horrible, domineering image of the seated Pope, sort of a handout like this in blessing or in command, we don't know, with a sword by his side. Um, and Michelangelo doesn't want to do the commission at all, but the Pope says, look, mate, you're going to do it. So he um, goes to Bologna, and he works hard on this commission between 1506 and 1507. We have lots and lots of letters from Michelangelo in Bologna to his brother, Buonarotto, Buonarotti, that's a good name, isn't it, um, in Florence, explaining about this commission, saying, you know, how frustrating it is, how complicated it is, and whatever. And we know that Michelangelo was rather nervous about the casting of this work because it was you know, so, such a colossal figure. He dismissed the first two bronze casters who'd been brought in. He got the head of the um, state artillery in Florence to undertake the casting, thinking he was bound to do a good job. Well, unfortunately not. Um, when the, uh, the, the, the bronze cast was dug out of the casting mould, um, it only came out halfway done. Up, um, the bottom half, I think, was done, and the top half didn't come out. Michael is furious. He has to redo the casting model. Eventually, the figure uh, is made. It is installed on the facade of San Petronio in 1508. And wait for it, irony of ironies, less than three years afterwards, the Bolognese revolt against the Pope again. They pull the sculpture off the facade of Bologna Cathedral, they melt it down, they turn it into a canon called La Giulia, ironically after Pope Julius II, and they fire it against the papal troops. So we have no visual evidence of what, this is why I haven't got a slide for you, we don't know what this sculpture looked like. It clearly had a bearing on all the later papal statues, seated and throned, domineering, you know, um, from, you know, Renaissance sculptors through to Benini, you know, obviously it informed the standard image of the seated Pope in triumph. But sadly, we don't know what it looked like, but clearly, at this time, 1507, 1508, Michelangelo is clearly involved in bronze. So please, ladies and gentlemen, don't let us think he's a marble carver. He's heavily involved in bronze at this first decade of the um, 16th century. And just to remind you that he's actually actively associated with bronze throughout his life. And at the very end of his life, uh, in 1560, so he's in his 80s, the regent of France, uh, Caterina de' Medici, asks him to make a, an equestrian monument to her husband, the late Henri de of France, who's just been, um, uh, he's just died of jousting wounds. Michelangelo says, I'm too old, uh, I'm too tired, I'm worn out, but actually I'll, I'll make a design for, uh, for this monument, particularly of the horse, um, and actually my pupil, uh, Daniele da Volterra, will actually oversee the making of the, the full-scale model and the casting. Uh, well, unfortunately, Michelangelo dies on the job, 1564, as does uh, Daniele da Volterra. Apparently, the whole casting process was so fraught, um, you know, he, he, according to the biographers, he dies as the, as the kind of horse is being dragged out of the casting pit, but, you know, it pushed him to an early grave, so on. But um, this is a, a later engraving of the horse that remained in Rome for many, many years, and eventually in the 17th century, it was taken to France. Uh, another French king was popped on the top, and you see Michelangelo's designed horse uh, in the Place de Vosges in Paris with this other, not Henry II, another later French king plopped on the top. Guess what? French Revolution, 1793, you've got it, melted down, turned into a cannon, we don't have it. All I'm saying is that in Michelangelo is associated with the bronze and it's a common misunderstanding that he's not. Onwards. Right. What else is Michelangelo doing in the first decade of the 16th century? Obviously, the Sistine Chapel. Um, he gets the commission from Pope Julius II in 1508. So from that moment on, he's absolutely obsessed with the idealised male nude. The uh, ceiling is full of them, uh, and you have to remember the ignudi, these over-40 paired 
idealized memories. We think, in a way, they, the Rothschild bronzes have this connection with the paired ignudi. But in addition to the fictive uh, nudes, if you like, uh, he created a number of images of biblical scenes. This is just showing you again nudes astride animals, not panthers, but rams. Um, this is the scene of the sacrifice of Noah on the ceiling. But also, do remember that in addition to the, as it were, fictive nudes, you also have many, many pairs of these bronze ignudetti, the little ignudi. So paired bronzes, Michelangelo's, I think, is also thinking about very much indeed. So we all know about the Sistine Chapel, and obviously Michelangelo, in preparation, is making numerous figure studies of the uh, male nude. It's also very important to remember the incomplete or lost works in that first decade. And Professor Joannides um, uh, thinks that uh, there are a number of um, drawings by Michelangelo and drawings by, you know, copy drawings uh, by his pupils connected with two very important, sadly lost or never completed um, fresco cycles. So we've got the Sistine Chapel that survives, thank the Lord, quite literally, but other two frescoes he was working on, they didn't come to completion. What you see here is, um, uh, you actually all need to go and see this. This is actually in Hokum Hall uh, in nearby in Norfolk here. Um, it's a copy uh, by a pupil of Michelangelo of the central part of Michelangelo's larger design or a cartoon for uh, an important fresco that the Florentine Republican government commissioned from him in 1504, known as the Battle of Cascina. Now, some of you may know this uh, because it was done in direct competition, this, this commission, with Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, the Florentine government commissioned Leonardo to make an ambitious multi-figure composition of another famous Florentine battle, victory against their hated Pisan rivals. So Leonardo was asked to do the Battle of the Anghiari, uh, that was made, it survived, and then unfortunately due to sort of technical difficulties and conservation has now fallen away. But we have a better idea of what that Leonardo fresco looked like. Michelangelo did a lot of figure studies for the Battle of the Anghiari, and we don't know why, I think due to pressure of work, Pope Julius II, he got pulled away. He never finished it, but he did do figure drawings in relation to that. And this is the um, most detailed copy, I say he, he made the full-scale drawing, the cartoon that was going to be translated onto the wall, um, apparently got chopped up by a jealous rival. don't know if there's any truth. This is what Vasari tells us. So the original draw, uh, design by Michelangelo doesn't survive, but these copies do. Again, you can see loads and loads of men in action. The, the story about this is that uh, the Florentine soldiers uh, were walking off to do battle with the Pisans, got overheated in their armour, stripped off, dipped into the Arno, all nude, and then the, 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 the trumpet sounds saying, actually, the Pisans are about to ambush you. So, oh, argh, help. Struggle out of the River Arno, battling to get their clothes on, get their armour on. So it was a nice excuse to show the nude male in action. So that's, you have to remember that. The other um, important fresco that Michelangelo was working on, we, well, we believe it was for a fresco, it might have been for a painting, but more likely for a fresco, was the martyrdom of the 10,000. Again, a very, very obscure subject. Um, a Roman legionary, uh, St. Acacius, I think he was called, and his 10,000 soldier friends, um, they all converted to Christianity and they were all murdered and crucified on Mount Ararat. Um, and this subject was quite popular with um, patrons in the Renaissance. Again, a nice legitimate excuse to show the male nude. Maybe not 10,000 of them, but a lot of them. Um, and so um, Paul has found a number of drawings that actually were previously associated either with the Battle of Cascina fresco or the Sistine Chapel fresco, but actually they clearly show men being crucified. They're tied to trees, and they're all in these very, very complicated poses. And Paul thinks that from um, dating all of these drawings that can be absolutely associated subject matter-wise with this lost uh, 
martyrdom of the 10,000, that Michelangelo was working on this topic um, around 1506-1507. So just to recap, he's busy working on marble figures, the David and so on. He's busy working on bronzes in this first decade of the 16th century. And he's busy working on complicated multi-figure frescoes, the Cachina, the martyrdom of the 10,000, sadly they didn't exist, but the Sistine did. So we look at his oeuvre. All these drawings, I think you'll agree, they have certain stylistic similarities. These early, early pen drawings of the male nude in, uh, in action. This is a beautiful back of a figure. And again, um, the interest that Michael had in every single part of the body, you know, to get it absolutely right. So he's doing detailed studies for individual figures and individual body parts to get it all absolutely right. Again, a detail of, uh, of a whole figure. This is a drawing in the Louvre. Again, I think you can see there is a great similarity in the works. This is a uh, detail, uh, sorry, a drawing in, in um, uh, uh, I think, the British Museum. This is an early, early study, about 1508, for the Sistine Chapel. You've got an architectural sketch of how he might lay the whole thing out on the uh, on your left, um, and then some very interesting detailed uh, studies of um, arms, a little detail extract there, I think you can see the similarity, and again, this very typical Michelangelesque gesture. So that's the visual evidence, but as I say, you know, I may say, I think that looks very similar, and you might say, Vicky, you're completely barking, I don't think it looks similar at all. So Visual analysis, however rigorous you do it and however systematic you are, is always going to be subjective. Okay, so we felt it was important to try to garner other evidence that may help to support our theory uh, that these bronzes are the first decade of the 16th century. <laughs>